From Transport Topics in Washington, D.C., this is Road Signs. And now here's your host, Michael Fries. Thank you for listening to Road Signs, the podcast series from Transport Topics that explores the trends and technologies that are shaping the future of trucking. Before we dive into today's episode, we'd like to invite you to subscribe to Transport Topics, where you can receive exclusive access to our Top 100 list, quarterly magazines, and other news surrounding the trucking industry. To subscribe, visit ttn.ws slash tt subscribe. 60,000. That is the number of drivers that the trucking industry needs just this year to keep up with the growing demand of commerce in the United States, according to the American Trucking Associations. What's worse, that number is likely to increase as online demand continues to surge. Trucking companies have been trying to remedy the situation with increases in compensation and benefits, as well as outreach to attract a newer, younger worker pool. However, in a post-pandemic era, fleets are finding out that the hiring landscape is a different place than it was in previous years. So for this episode, we'll ask the question, how are trucking companies attracting new drivers into the industry? To answer that question, we'll speak with Tamara Jalvin, Vice President of Safety and Talent Recruitment with Yellow Corporation later in the program. But first, we'll look into the effects of the wave of driver pay increases in response to the ongoing driver shortage with our first guest, Transport Topic reporter, Connor Wolf. Welcome to the show, Connor. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You know, this has been an issue that has been on the minds of many in the industry, and it's an ongoing issue with the answers not readily known to those uh, that are handling fleet staffing. You've been covering this particular topic for quite some time, and just the, the topic of driver pay. When it comes to the driver shortage, one of the things that fleets are doing has been uh, the, the announcement of, of pay raises. And um, the, the, I guess the ongoing question from that particular time would be, you know, how are things uh, faring uh, with the, the staffing issues that fleets have and, and their, their solution of rising those pay rates? And, and I know you've been covering this for quite some time, but from uh, this has been happening for, I guess, the last year or two. And you've been keeping track of those fleets who are you know, announcing those pay raises and implementing those types of pay structures. So from your reporting, how has that landscape changed or, or is it stay, stayed the same? Uh, yeah, it, it's incredibly interesting what's happening right now. And uh, yeah, pay is has been one of the primary uh, ways that uh, carriers have looked to tackle the uh, driver shortage. Um, yeah, it, it, the driver shortage itself is a long-term, um, m- many-year issue that goes back a while. But really since uh, a little bit after the coronavirus began, it started to increase exponentially. And um, there's two reasons for that. One, we've seen a high demand environment after kind of an early crash in the coronavirus around, uh, er, you know, early 2020, we saw kind of a, uh, a mini kind of freight recession, if you will, but that quickly resolved. And all of a sudden we saw a massive demand environment because of um, numerous issues. But one of the bigger issues was just a change in buying behavior from consumers. People were spending more on tangible goods as opposed to services, stuff like that. People were getting exercise equipment for their home because they were on quarantine. They were being locked down. Uh, People were buying uh, wood and uh, different things from stores like Home Depot and stuff in order to do some remodeling and stuff. Uh, Basically, all the behaviors you would expect people would be doing when they're staying at home, they did. That demand environment was incredibly strong for the freight industry, and it's kind of continued. Some of the pressure have changed. Obviously, services are becoming, have already become um, popular again now that lockdowns aren't really a thing anymore, but the demand environment has stayed strong for the most part. Uh, So that was one issue that created a need for more drivers. If you have more freight demand, you're going to need more drivers. And that kind of just makes sense. But at the same time, because of the coronavirus, you also had a lot of people leave the industry. They either took jobs where they're not traveling around the country. uh, So they're there was less of a risk to uh, getting sick. Um, they might have become construction workers. There's a lot of overlap in terms of uh, people going into construction, people going into to driving uh, for freight companies, uh, carriers. So that happened a lot too. And then there was also a lot of early retirements, uh, something that um, you know all of your listeners will 
probably know is that there's a lot of um, older drivers in the industry. It's a lot of people over 30 and a lot of, especially a lot of people close to retirement age. And with the uh, with the issue of potentially becoming sick, a lot of people chose early retirement. So those were two issues, high demand, but less people in the industry. So what was, so this driver shortage issue became incredibly much more worse in the last couple of years. So what did carriers do to try to ease up that problem? Well, of course they raised pay along with some other things like life improvement strategies, more home time benefits, uh, sign on bonuses. There's a bunch of stuff that they try uh, that they've been trying to do, some of them successful, some of them not. And pay raise has been probably the biggest, most notable thing they've done. There was a survey by um, the American Trucking Associations uh, that said that driver pay right now is estimated to be a medium annual of 69 uh, over sixty nine thousand dollars in 2021 and that reflects a basically an 18% increase. Uh, we will have to wait a little bit um, for to know what the numbers will be for this year, but presumably we're going to see even we're going to see more of an increase. Um, and that based on kind of what we're hearing anecdotally from different carriers continuing to raise pay. Uh, however, there has been some changes, um, I'd say in the last quarter, uh, maybe a little bit less uh, last quarter half a quarter, somewhere in there, uh, where trends are starting to change a little bit. Uh, the first trend that's um, that we should know is that while we're still in a very high demand environment, and that's important to note because we're not in a freight recession, we're not in anything like that, uh, but there does seem to be somewhat of a slowdown. Now we're talking about a slowdown from incredibly high speeds to less high speeds. So it's not like we're not speeding down the highway when it comes to freight demand. Um, but we're still, it still seems to be slowing down just a tad bit. We saw this in the Q2 uh, reports from a lot of carriers where they were reporting, hey, this was a really good quarter for us, but we're starting to see those early, early signs of a slowdown. So just be prepared for that. So, um, so that's something that that's obviously going to affect it. Another thing that's uh, that's a trend that um, seems to be happening is there's been kind of a split off in terms of how much uh, carriers are paying attention to pay raises, which is natural. We've had um, close to two years of pretty much consistent pay raises, pay raises, pay raises. And now we're starting to see some breakdown across different um, sectors of the industry. Those carriers um, that have been ahead of the curb, as it were, when it came to pay raises, those ones that were really pushing the envelope and really being competitive about it over the last two years, well, we're seeing less pay raises from them now just because their pay raises are already so so high. Uh, those ones that were just trying to stay with the market, well, they're kind of split. Some of them are st continuing to raise pay and some of them are kind of happy with where they are right now because they were able to keep up with basically the market trends. And then the real pressure right now uh, to raise pay is on those carriers that decided not to raise pay over the last two years. They're continuing to feel pressure because they kind of, obviously just by nature of them not raising pay, uh, they're they're kind of in this position where they're still feeling pressure to. So while the last two years has seen an overall push uh, to raise pay um, across all carriers, now we're starting to see a little bit of a breakdown. Uh, which we would have expect to see at some point, and now we're starting to see. From time to time, an issue commands so much of the industry's attention that it requires a deeper dive, a resource readers can turn to, a transport topic special report. We're turning our attention to another big issue, electrification and the key factors that will drive this industry trend. In every case, we're working to provide our readers with information, analysis, and clarity on key issues confronting fleets. One comprehensive resource packed with insights that can give you the edge. Transport Topics invites you to learn more about our special reports. To reserve your copy of the latest special report, visit ttn.ws forward slash electrification. It's funny that you uh, you just mentioned the, the pressure that other carriers who did not follow that path early on in, in driver uh, raising driver pay 
are are are, are now are now failing. You know, there's there's certain you know um, segments of the industry that are, that are failing this you know more than others, and I mean you can uh, talk upon that you know um, later. When it comes to you know independent contractors, you know those. I mean you, we're talking about you know getting more drivers into the fold, and you know there has been a lot more of those owner operators or those who are wanting, wanting to get into the trucking industry, you know, because of the, uh, of the good, you know, of the good pay that, that this is that's often promoted with, uh, you know, organizations like uh, ATA and things like that. Um, but for instance, you have something in, in California where you have the, the California, the California assembly bill, uh, bill five, where it's talking about classifying workers as uh, uh, independent contractors, especially when it comes into uh, the, the world of transport. And, and that in itself is, is also having a direct effect on driver pay as a whole. Can you um, kind of dive deep into that a, a little bit more and, and how much of an impact that has on driver pay and the driver shortage as a whole? Yeah, uh, most certainly. And you, uh, you touched upon something very interesting right there, uh, which is obviously when we have a high pay environment, uh, that's going to turn a couple heads. And so we saw this increase in independent drivers over the last couple of years. And these independent drivers, you know, they um, sometimes they're people that were new to the industry, but um, oftentimes you don't really see that. But that's still a case sometimes. And a lot of times it's just people who were, you know, were a company drivers somewhere who were just like, hey, this is a really good place to be right now. I might as well go into business for myself because the getting is good right now. So we saw this increase in independent drivers that were a combination of uh, potentially new drivers and then people coming um, that were formerly company drivers. And so they really were trying to ride the wave and some of them were really, really successful in doing that. But now we're in a situation because pay is kind of, it hasn't really stopped rising, but it's become more selective and the demand environment is starting to slow, show early signs uh, that's slowing down. There is the potential that those trends that um, that those independent drivers were picking up on uh, may soon change. And that's going to leave a lot of questions such as, well, will they leave the industry? Will they go back to becoming company drivers? Uh, those sort of things could potentially um, happen. And obviously, if they just become a company driver, well, it's definitely going to change the dynamic, but it won't be that big a deal because they're still their capacity is still in the industry. However, if they decide to leave the industry, that is going to be a big deal because you know that's less capacity in the industry. Now, the decision of whether they're going to um, leave the industry or just kind of reposition themselves, uh, that kind of comes down to how smart they were able to kind of manage their business uh, as an independent driver. Now, those seasoned drivers, those drivers that have been in the industry for years, they know what they're doing, but they were company drivers. When they became independent drivers, there's a very good chance those type of drivers with experience were smart about saving saving funds for a rainy day, uh, investing where they need to invest, um, taking taking good contract, taking good jobs, uh, figuring out the best areas of the spot market, what load boards to use. You know, they were they, they were probably smart about it just by nature of having experience. Um, then the other two categories are the new drivers, uh, the new people to the industry that became independent right off the bat, who also made smart decisions despite not having that experience, uh, but they just, you know, were savvy and they knew what to do? Um, well, they may they may continue to be independent drivers, or they um, they may become company drivers. Then there's the ones who um, who were new to the industry but didn't make those smart business decisions. Well, they're gonna they're not gonna have any choice when things start to settle down or potentially um, start shrinking a little bit, which is which is a possible um, which is possible given kind of what we're um, we're seeing right now what they they won't have a choice but to either leave the industry or become company drivers um so that's kind of the demand dynamic at play here what are they going to do how many options do they have uh and what will that mean for capacity to the overall industry uh ideally most of them the ones that don't stick with becoming uh with staying as independent drivers uh, the ones that uh, decide that's not right for them anymore, hopefully they become company drivers because then we don't lose that capacity. We only just change the dynamic and how that capacity is used. Uh, but 
there's a good chance a good amount of them will leave the industry. And that's obviously going to put more uh, strain on an industry that's already suffering from capacity issues. Connor, when you were talking about repositioning, uh, would that also include... I guess that shift from the, that 10,000 foot view of things when it comes to the, the class eight over the ride driver and the increasing emergence of uh, last mile delivery and just that whole dynamic of, of drivers and, and just the, the, uh, the lifestyle of, you know, one being on the road uh, days at a time versus, you know, having something close to that, that nine to five where, you know, you're making, you know, last mile deliveries to folks. I mean, does, I'm pretty sure that shift has a lot to do in potential drivers going to companies and just kind of asking for the right conditions. I mean, am, am I right in that assessment? Most certainly. Um, and that's an important nuance to kind of note here because, you know, when most people think of the trucking industry, they're thinking of the kind of over the road, long haul type drivers that, um, uh, you know, that they see on the highway. But of course, that's not the full extent of the trucking industry. You have those last mile, those final mile type type drivers that are very much a big part of the industry and becoming a bigger part of the industry because of things like e-commerce and stuff like that. What happened during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which was interesting but not surprising at all, is we saw a rapid, rapid increase in the use of e-commerce by consumers. Um, obviously, e-commerce was already pretty popular before the pandemic, uh, but you had people you, that were users of e-commerce that were starting to use it in new ways, such as ordering groceries because they, um, you know, they either couldn't go out to the grocery store because of lockdowns, or they didn't want to because they didn't want to be around other people. Uh, so they got used to that. Maybe they, maybe in the past, they would order stuff off Amazon, but they didn't really order food. Uh, groceries off off some of these services. Well, now they're uh, they're used to it now, so uh, so they may do it. And then maybe some um, some people that never used e-commerce, maybe they're older Americans or something like that, who kind of had to because of the pandemic. Well, then they got used to that as well. So um, so while we saw a, um, a rapid increase in the use of e-commerce. We started to see that slow down um, uh, as lockdowns were lifted and stuff like that, which, which is to be expected. However, a slowdown doesn't mean that it shrunk. And what we seem, what seemed to have happened, is a permanent uh, step function upwards in the use of e-commerce, uh, which is really, really interesting to think about. Where um, yes, it's not increasing as much as it was but it's still increasing the use of it. Um, and it's still at a very high amount. So all, so all the gains that e-commerce made during the pandemic didn't disappear now that the pandemic settled down. Um, so that means a lot of things for the trucking industry. It means that last mile will continue to be um, an important piece of this. Basically anything that has to do with e-commerce on the trucking, logistics, rail, all of those sides, anything that has to do with e-commerce, uh, they're going to continue to see a strong environment there just because people are used, more used to using e-commerce now than before the pandemic. And um, that's something to note. Another thing that how this plays into kind of the driver shortage and the, um, and the pay increase issue and stuff like that is last mile and fi the final mile type carriers uh, don't have as much issues finding uh, drivers. And there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one, uh, the biggest probably, the biggest issue, uh, reason why people are attracted to that form of trucking uh, is that you're more likely to have a normal nine to five job since you're being local. You're more likely to see your family or your loved ones on any uh, every single day, basically. Normal weekends, normal work hours. Um, just because you're moving locally, you don't really have that with the guys that travel across large regions or even across the country because they're out for days, weeks at a time sometimes. Um, and then they'll have a little bit of home time where they'll have a couple of days off in order to come back home. And that's assuming their truck is not in the shop. And let's not forget that, um, because of some of the uh, equipment, issues, especially as it came to semiconductor chips, it's harder to get new equipment now, harder to get, get new trucks, which means trucks are more likely, just by nature of them being older, they're more likely to be in the shop, which means that, hey, if you're in the shop 
um, during your home time and you're across the country, well, you're not going to get to see your family because you're in the shop at that moment. So, so all these factors play into um, the over the, uh, the long haul drivers um, are, are, are the ones that are struggling more so to find uh, drivers to find capacity than say some of these uh, local region, these local halls where you're pretty much just moving within a city or town um, and you're just kind of doing local deliveries. Um, that's what we've been seeing. Um, that's something that will probably continue even, even as some of these pressures, such as if we do indeed, if these signs of slowing demand do indeed pan out uh, to some degree and we start to see all this stuff, well, we're, even if with those changes, we're still going to probably see that din- dynamic play out uh, where, uh, where it's a lot easier for some of the shorter haul carriers to find drivers just by nature of it being local and and more accessible you know it's it's like a role-playing video game it's it's when, when you get one board is done one one level is done you're you're on to the the next level with uh even more uh unique challenges and that's what the the, the driver shortage issue kind of sounds like so so uh, but connor you know thanks for for coming on and explaining this issue to us in the uh the ten thousand foot view of things and, and what fleets are doing to, to, to handle this particular situation. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It was great to talk with you. Transport topics in one word, authoritative. Knowledge. Outstanding. Reliable. We ask transport topics readers to describe us in one word. Informative. Informative. Integrity. The Bible. Authoritative. The authority. Transportation information, that's two, but I, I, I gotta have it both. Physically large. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's two words. Visit influence.ttnews.com forward slash say hello to find out what they're talking about. Welcome back to Road Signs. We've talked about the effects of the wave of driver pay increases in response to the ongoing driver shortage. Now we'll look into how fleets are approaching recruitment and retaining drivers with our next guest, Tamara Jalvin. Vice President of Safety and Talent Recruitment with Yellow Corporations. Welcome to the show, Tamara. Thank you. And just to let you, uh, um, the viewers know, uh, Yellow Corporation is number 10 in our 2022 Transport Topics Top 100 for Hire Carriers in North America list. So just to keep that to note. Um, but um, Tamara, um, you know, we definitely want to talk about the the ongoing uh, driver shortage. Uh, you know, we, have, we have spoken to our reporter, Connor Wolf, about the, the wave of driver pay increases and how that's going in the industry. But, you know, just kind of in your position, you know, you're you're handling the the recruitment of, of drivers through all of Yellow Corporation, not just uh I mean not just the different segments, but you're you know, you oversee all of that. And, you know, there's there's quite a bit of, of challenges when it comes to company re- recruitment, you know, um, as you as you would know and everyone else probably listening knows, you know, the um, the ATA, the American Trucking Associations. Um, had forecast that you know in the, the coming year we're going to need about eighty thousand new uh, new drivers to to fill this this void of the of the driver shortage and you're in a position that where you could you could address that but you know as I said and as you know this is an ongoing issue so you know what are those um, current challenges when it comes to uh, uh, company recruitment and what are the things that you're that you're seeing well you know first of all I, we have to talk about the fact that this is a very strong job market that we're in right now. As you've already said, you know, companies are competing um, with each other for talent and not just within the trucking industry, but across multiple industries. So when we're looking for dock employees or we're looking for drivers, we're not just competing with, um, you know, uh, less than truckload carriers like ourselves. We're competing, you know, across uh, an entire industry and, and for talent that maybe has never even considered being in trucking. Um, And that's our hope is that we're going to attract um, a wide variety of diverse candidates into the industry um, and keep them in the industry as well. Before we talk about the retainment of it, it's just, as you mentioned, you know, there's this, this challenge of recruiting the new members into the fold. You know, when uh, if if you were to go to Hollywood, you, you go to Central Casting, and and they they will want to uh, you know have the the typical truck driver. I mean, what they will come with is you know a fifty five year old white male, and then most of those most of most of the, the the people who fall in that category are you know 
on their way to retiring or, you know, retiring already in the industry. You know, what are the efforts that you're doing? I mean, and maybe, you know, other, you know, other companies that you've, you've, you've seen, I mean, who are in your position, what are you doing to uh, attract those drivers that aren't necessarily, um, you know, privy to the, the world and the lifestyle of, of, of a truck driver? Boy, you're hitting on a couple of different elements, and I, I really want to address both. Uh, what are we doing to not to, to number one attract diverse talent, um, people that have never considered the trucking industry, but at the same time, when they do want to think about becoming, let's say, a professional truck driver, what's the path? How do they get there? What's the training do they need? Um, and and how do we uh, align? Uh, how do we make it simple for them to get that training and to be able to transition into a career that Literally, it's a career that's going to pay them well and give them the benefits and the opportunities, you know, for their for their uh, for their families that they're looking for. So, companies can bring in new drivers from other companies all day long. We prefer to train our own because we need to tap into a younger, diverse pool of candidates, pool of talent um, that maybe had never considered trucking in the past. They didn't know that this would be a productive, lucrative. A career for them that paid well, that gave strong benefits, and that it w- could be relatively easy to get the endorsements, the certification, the training that they need, and at no cost. So, what are companies like, you know, what we're doing is we're focusing on our apprenticeship programs. We have 22 driver academies nationwide. We're getting ready to open another one. Um, in October, we have three more targeted after that. Um, we just opened one up in Albuquerque. And so this is a Department of Labor approved apprenticeship program um, that is designed to, to help people you know, achieve their commercial driver's license while at the same time teaching them how to be safe drivers you know, today and 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now like many of our drivers currently are. With that particular program, what kind of feedback have you had from that? I mean, just, I mean, you said you had 22 of these academies. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the, the feedback is, is, is uh, tremendously positive about that. This year, we have graduated 650 new CDLA. We've netted 650 new CDLA, commercial driver's license, class A drivers from our academies. And not a single one of them had to pay for that training. As a matter of fact, we paid them while they were in training. We paid for all of their expenses. We tra- paid for their training, um, and we positioned them uh, with a, you know, with a with a with a driving career th- that automatically put them in, a, in, a, in an opportunity for ongoing mentorship and training um, uh, benefits, and uh, you know, and a new job. Basically, and they didn't, you know, we really believe strongly that no one should have to pay to get their CDL. And so it's not just, uh, you know, us as a company that's standing behind that, but it's our other drivers that also stand behind that, that are mentoring the next generation of drivers. They believe just as strongly that um, we all collectively have a responsibility to address the driver shortage, not just by sourcing them from other companies, but by building the next generation. First of all, just you know, when you when you tell someone who's looking for a career and, and exploring a, tra- a career in trucking that, you know, we'll send you to school and we'll, and we'll do, you know, free a cost, you know, that's going to be a, you know, a, a, um, a major driver in that in that decision for those that are that are in, that are interested, you know. But uh, you know, but the reality is the situation of uh, just kind of the 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 pool of drivers that we have now. I think uh, you know. If, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think we have about what seven to eight percent of the pool that are women that 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 are in. I mean, that, that are drivers in in this country. Um, you know, that's a, you know, even though I think what last year uh, it was maybe 6% and it's grown to 8%. I mean, that's a significant growth, but still, um, you know, overwhelmingly a, a small, a small, um, a small percentage you know, that, that are women drivers, you know, and yourself being in, in the position that you are in, um, you know, what have, uh, what have you seen um, in uh, trucking companies do in, in, in yellow itself? What what have you done to to be more aggressive in recruiting women in the industry? Since I mean, it's such a small number, a, a number percentage that, that are in it now. 
It really is a small number, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to change that. And we partner with many other organizations, um, first and foremost, to change the way um, change the way people think about trucking and what it means. You know, whether you're you know a younger employee, a multicultural employee, or if you're a woman, you know that this is, it may have been and may still be today, a male populated um, business, but it's not necessarily, you know, we, we often use the term, it's not necessarily male dominated, you know, so we got to change the way we think about it. Women who thought it was strictly for men or youth who thought they, you know, had to go to college to get these kind of positions uh, is, is, is not the case anymore. So, um, you know, we actively engage in other organizations to lead the perspective of trucking by starting to change the image, having the conversation, um, building uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, you know, and belonging programs. We have great employee resource groups that uh, we explain during the recruiting process that when you come to our, or our organization, um, you're going to be able to be a part of this. These are employee-led initiatives um, to make sure that, you know, everyone's voice is heard, that there is equity, um, and that there is development, mentorship, and ongoing uh, opportunities to grow a career. But I really think that changing the perspective, you know, sometimes we have to change our own perspective. I certainly did when I joined uh, this industry, when I was asked to join this industry. My first response was, what? Trucking? Why would I want to work in trucking? And now today, I've often said, if I could have, if I could go back in time 30 years ago, I would have done it then. You know, this is an industry that I think women are beautifully suited for. It requires that you have to be, you know, highly organized. You have to be good at building relationships. You have to be strong communicators. These are things that women are especially skilled at. So why not? consider the trucking industry. And so we've got to have those conversations. We've got to partner with other organizations so that we start to change the image and the perspective of, of the industry. You know, you were talking about just changing the perspective and and you had addressed that very eloquently about uh, you know, gender, uh, but also when it comes to I mean, speaking with, you know, younger, I mean, speaking to uh, the, the, the situation about younger drivers is the perception there as well. You know, I'm, even me, I, I'm, I, I'm guess uh, I'm a man of a certain age, Gen Xer. When I have thought of trucking you know, before I got into the industry, you know, of, you know, smoking the bandit, you know, and it was just sort of, you know, you're, you're out on the road for days, weeks at a time. And, and, you know, I, when I was, you know, in my younger days, I, I lived next to a, a truck driver and he was gone Monday through Friday and, you know, he was, you know, California and back. And, uh, you know, and that, and that perception has kind of, has kind of changed as well when it comes to, you know, last mile delivery and, and, and just other regional treks that, that, that you know, trucking companies offer, um, and, and doing that. And I'm pretty sure yellow is in that space as well. So, um, how well have you communicated that to new drivers that, you know, this is not like, you know, I'm, I'm going to use smoking the bandit, <laughs> you know, but it's not, it's not like that where, I mean, it, it can be like that if you, if, if you, you know, have that, if you're adaptable to that particular lifestyle. But, you know, um, young people who think that that is the the only thing associated with truck driving. I mean, what do you do to communicate that to young drivers when they're at least thinking about getting into the industry? Well, certainly it starts with a lot of the uh, marketing and advertising that we do relative to, you know, the, the job postings, staying on the job boards, the way we describe our jobs, the way we um, you know, leverage our marketing, the way we, you know, depict the industry on, you know, in a truck wrap, you know, we got to show that it's not the, the same way. But a lot of it also goes back to um, the conversations that our recruiters have that our own employees have with potential new candidates. And we explain to them that, you know, it's, it's not the smoky and the bandit of the good old days um, that, you know, we, we are changing the network design where you're home every day. It's not, it's not like you're in a position where you're going to be gone weeks at a time. Um, you know, even being gone a week at a time, we have that option available to you if that's what you want. And some people do. Some people want to spend that much time on the road. They want to make, the, you know, that mileage distance. Um, but many others don't, especially the younger workforce coming in, or as we were just talking about, you know, often women's needs are different. Um, and so it's demanding that we do things differently. So the nice part about our network redesign is it not only services the needs of our, our 
customers and of course ultimately our consumers who you know you know have needs to get their, their groceries and their medical supplies to them delivered when they want but it's also going to help us attract um, the, the the new workforce because you, you can be home every night you can be home for dinner you can be home for we often say for the soccer game and our recruiters explain that to drivers if that's what you want we have options we have op we have career path development we have options in driving positions as well as you know we have you know great pay great benefits you know i can't help but mention the fact that and if you're in trucking you know this but again, this is about making sure that other people understand this. We have a lot of drivers that are making in excess of $100,000. We also have early 20 year olds that are new drivers that are making in excess of 60 grand and they're getting great benefits. And if they didn't already have their commercial driver's license, we probably trained them and paid for them to get it. I mean, that's a great opportunity. Uh, for them to now say, all right, what's the career, what's the trucking career that I want? Do I want to go long haul and and be gone for a period of time? Um, do, you know, and do I want to do that for a year or two? Do I want to do it out of this state versus that state? We have so many options, and that's what we want people to understand about the industry. You know, Tamara, uh, I'll just have one more question before I let you go. I know you're very busy. Um, you know, you had mentioned the pay. Uh, you know that that you know, the younger, the younger, um, a younger driver would have and, and those who are making, you know, six figures, you know, dr you know, um, driving commercially, you know, um, and just kind of with the, the, the raise, uh, I'd mentioned this to, to Connor, where during the pandemic, the already struggle of the, uh, of the driver shortage, you know, it's just exasperated that, that whole situation, I mean, the pandemic did at least. And then, then you know, trucking companies at, at large were pretty much, uh, battling that uh, post pandemic with, you know, even during the pandemic, but battling that with you know, rising pay rates, you know, just kind of announcing that, you know, they're, they're raising their, their, their payments to drivers. And right now, you know, after a year or two of that, you know, it's, it's sort of at a crossroads right now. I mean, and, and you being in the space of, you know, uh, you know, of safety and, and talent recruitment, have you seen from your position, has that re really made an impact? you know, to, to gaining more drivers, even, even, you know, getting experienced drivers to, uh, from, from other, from other fleets to come join you guys. I mean, has that been a, the uh, effective as, as, as you wanted it to be, or, or even not just with yellow, maybe just an in industry wide, like what, what's your take on that? Well, I, I believe it's certainly having some impact and, and benefit uh, to our employees. And, you know, I can't really comment on, you know, what, you know, other companies have or have not done, but, we all know wages tend to increase in a competitive job market, um, no matter what the industry is. And, you know, at Yellow, we're under a collective bargaining agreement um, and we have a team that focuses on trucker relations and and managing to that agreement. Um, you know, so we're proud of what we're doing. We're proud of where we've been able to give increases. And, um, you know, and I think it's contributing to the fact that, you know, many of our employees have worked here 20, 30, 40 years says something about the company, the culture, the job, the industry, um, regardless of what's happening, um, you know, with the, the wage competitiveness today. So we're going to continue to, you know, um, to address those issues. We're going to continue to, you know, invest in employee development and recognition and, you know, the apprenticeship programs. You're probably aware our CEO had just announced at the White House this week that we're expanding our apprenticeship programs. We're going to continue to invest in those things um, to keep people within uh, within the folds of this industry and within our own company. You know, it's 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 really great that you know, Yellow has this apprentice program where you know you're you're paying for the training and you know, helping you know young drivers get into the industry and 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 make a fulfilling career out of it. And and that's uh that's something that's uh you know uh, that's very encouraging, definitely uh, for for those who are who are looking for a career in, in, in trucking. We've been speaking with Tamara Jalving. Vice President of Safety and Talent Recruitment with Yellow Corporation. Tamara, it was a pleasure having you on and thanks for making us understand this issue of the driver shortage more clearly and appreciate you having uh, the time to join us on Road Signs. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Did you know you can ask Alexa to open transport topics? In just one minute, you will hear the biggest trucking headlines of that day. Be prepared and start your morning off right with transport topics. Before we close, 
Let's take a moment to revisit our original question. How are trucking companies attracting new drivers into the industry? As we heard from our guests, with the wave of pay rate hikes subsiding, it's fair enough to take a step back to see where and how the issue of finding and retaining drivers is going. For some trucking companies, the rise in rates seems to be the right move, while others, who have been hesitant to raise wages, are playing catch up to add more drivers. With the lateral move by experienced drivers, moving from one fleet to another remains a constant, an aging demographic, and the perspective of a career in truck driving, be it negative or positive, plagues an industry that desperately needs commercial drivers. Yellow's Jalving noted their initiative, which includes paid education, could speak well to a new generation that's already weary of costly debt issues. However, if fleet leaders desire to grab a hold of a newer, different demographic, they'll need to take a newer, different approach in recruiting them. If you enjoyed this episode of Road Signs, please let others know. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. If my questions have sparked questions of your own, share them with the Road Signs team or reach me on Twitter at Michael V. Freeze. You can email us at share at ttnews.com. We'll read them and respond daily. And of course, we'll be back in two weeks with a new episode of Road Signs. Until then, I'm Michael Freeze. Thank you for listening.